Let me get started with my presentation, which is about reasoning with ontologies on knowledge graphs. Before um, going on to the more, let's say, technical part, I have a little bit of an introduction. My goal for this presentation is to basically give a high level description of what I do and uh, tell you a little bit about my career so um, you know what are my interests in case you know somebody has a uh, need of my expertise or wants to ask me some questions about what I do. Um, so that is that. I will start with uh, a small personal introduction about my career which started in the uh, United States. So I did my Master's and PhD at Wright State University, which is a university in Ohio. Uh, from 2011 to 2016, there I was working with Pascal Hisler. Uh, here you can see his book on the foundations of the semantic web, which is probably his most well-known uh, contribution. So the topics that I was working on there was description logics, which is a fragment of uh, first order logic. I was looking into problems such as the complexity of reasoning with different description logic languages, the implementation of reasoning algorithms, and a formal study of expressivity of these languages. And I was also working on the application of semantic web technologies. I was basically developing our ontologies with domain experts. Um, for a little bit during my PhD, I was uh, working at Oxford. Uh, there, for the most part, I was working with Bernardo Cuenca Grau, who's now a full professor. I believe basically uh, the same topics with a focus on conjunctive query answering. So for Bernardo, just uh, to see if some people can pinpoint him, perhaps his most well-known contribution is his participation on RDFOX, which is a startup which uh, basically is trying to uh, help users use knowledge representation languages for all different kinds of purposes, such as data integration. Now, after my uh, PhD, I was a postdoctoral researcher from 2016 to December of 2020 at the Technical University of Dresden in Germany, where I work with uh, Markus Krutz, whose most well-known contribution is Wikidata. Wikidata is the um, <clears throat> repository for all the structured and semi-structured information that is used in uh, the Wikimedia projects, for example, Wikipedia. Um, so here I changed my topic just a tiny, teeny bit. Instead of working with description logics, now I mostly work with existential rules, which is a more expressive uh, fragment of first order logic. But essentially, the topic is really the same, first order logic reasoning and uh, symbolic knowledge representation. So uh, at the moment, I am a CRCN researcher uh, since the beginning last year. Here are my affiliations, but I am uh, mostly employed by INRIA. I work at Montpellier. Uh, my team is at the moment graphic. We are soon to be, uh, be or soon to become Boreal. And uh, my topics haven't really changed at all since the end of my postdoc. I, I really was a very, uh, in a way, a very good fit. I, I, I have continued doing exactly what I was doing as a postdoc here in, in Montpellier. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about the venues where I usually publish. I thought they would be a good idea to share this information to um, basically help you understand what my topics are and the kind of events that I attend and so on and so forth. Um, so first and foremost, I publish in knowledge representation conferences such as KR and ITSCAR, um, also in artificial intelligence conferences like Itskai and AAAI, but admittedly this is more of KR basically because I always publish in the KR tracks. Uh, most of my research has to do with symbolic non, uh, knowledge representation. I don't really know much um, about things like machine learning or, or data mining or so on and so forth. I have also published uh, papers in database theory conferences such as POTS, ICDT and VLDV. Uh, but always to do with uh, always to do with logics and also in the semantic web world. This was more during my PhD. I haven't published in ISWC, SWC for a couple of years, uh, but I used to attend these conferences. All right. So anyway, just a brief summary here. So my main field of research is knowledge representation and reasoning with logical languages with fragments of first order logic. More specifically, I'm interested in the study of logical languages and the theoretical and computational properties, for example, complexity of reasoning or decidability. Uh, I focus on two different languages, existential rules and description logics. And I am also interested in the implementation of efficient reasoning algorithms. So after this uh, more personal 
um, introduction. I want to tell you a little bit about my research. Uh, and this presentation is going to be very, very high level. Uh, it is meant for uh, a computer science audience that may not know anything about logics. Uh, so the idea is uh, mostly to motivate uh, what I'm doing rather than to um, show technical content. Um, let me get started with it. So, um, as you all know, uh, we're living through the era of big data. So here we have a graph that tells us uh, basically how much information is produced every minute uh, during the year 2021. And obviously, when we have that much information, we want to solve some queries. And the question is like, how do we find the right answers in the ocean of big data? So one of the challenges that we have to face is that most of the data that we encounter in the web is unstructured. This is like plain text and therefore it's not easily accessible uh, by, by machines. So my research concerns itself with somewhat of an intermediate goal, which is how can we structure information so we find uh, the answers that we are looking for. So in this context, or to address this issue, uh, there's like an interesting development, in my opinion, which is the development of knowledge graphs. So these are large repositories that contain structured and semi-structured uh, information. So for example, I guess the most famous one would be Google's knowledge graph. Uh, there are others that were developed in academia, such as Wikidata and Wikipedia, and also even companies that are not big IT companies are starting to develop their own knowledge graphs to just improve the quality of their services. So for example, Airbnb and Uber uh, are developing uh, knowledge graphs. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, one of these um, one of these knowledge graphs, which is Wikidata, which is the central storage uh, for the structured data for the Wikimedia projects, such as Wikipedia. Um, maybe you have never heard about Wikidata, but possibly this is something that you've used because uh, it's something that's on your phone. So, for example, if you have an iPhone and you ask about Alan Turing, here's the information that you are going to get. Uh, so you're going to get some text that comes from um, Wikipedia. But you're also going to get some structured information that comes from Wiki, Wikidata. So here, for example, we would have that Alan Turing uh, was born in uh, this date, uh, this place, and here's his date uh, of, of death. So this is structured information. These are sort of database entries in an online repository that are you know, used to create this box of text. So this is already very useful, you know, like you can query Wikidata and automatically know the date of birth of uh, Alan Turing. You could know how uh, long did he live and so on and so forth. But sometimes this is not enough. Uh, sometimes we need to integrate information across different resources to really obtain the information that we're looking for. And to address this situation, what I'm going to be talking about is the ontology data, uh, ontology based data access framework. So the idea is that we have a query and then we have some data sources. What we do is we create an ontology which uh, provides us with a shared vocabulary and a conceptual view and allows us to integrate the information. On top of that, in the context of my research, ontologies have uh, or are equipped with formal semantics thus enabling the use of reasoning, which allows us to integrate the information, produce more information, and hopefully in this way we can get the answers that we're looking for. So let me uh, show you an example of the OBDA framework in action to um, further uh, motivate the usefulness of, of this idea. So let me say that this is a real world example that we published in one of our papers. If somebody is interested, uh, I am happy to share the materials with you. So uh, basically in this example, what we wanted to know is we wanted to know about the number of cancer related fatalities in the year 2019. Uh, for this, we use two different data sources. We use the DOID ontology and Wikidata. The DOID ontology contains information about diseases and their relationships. Wikidata contains information about fatalities and their causes. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to craft uh, the ontology, which basically in our setting is a set of first logic formulas. So basically here we have two rules that will extract information from the DID ontology. So the DID ontology has facts over a subclass disease uh, information. So for example, it will tell you that um, lung cancer is a form of cancer. So what we're doing with these two rules is we're trying the information, we, we're extracting the information about uh, subclass diseases, and then we're computing the transitive closure of that this subclass disease hierarchy. Now, once we have done this, we can successfully identify all types of cancer. So the DID162 is the ID in this ontology that corresponds to the most formal, uh, uh, the most general form of cancer. If some disease X is in subclass disease hierarchy with the uh, relationship with the DID162, then we classify it 
as one one some type of cancer. Now, after doing this, we're going to add some rules to be able to tell which uh, fatalities were caused by cancer and which ones weren't. So here, the red predicates, the red atoms, are atoms that come from from Wikidata. So let me give you an intuitive understanding of the meaning of these rules. So for example, what's the first one telling me? So the first one tells me that if X uh, was a fatality that was recently caused by Y, so Y is the cause of X, and Y has a disease ID associated, which is a form of cancer, then X is a cancer-related death. So I mean, uh, these two red facts would come, atoms would come from Wikidata, the black one we obtained through reasoning with this rule. Anyway, so the second rule says that if X was caused by Y, and uh, Y is uh, associated to a disease ID that is not cancer, then this is non-cancer related death. Finally, we have a third rule to identify um, deaths that were not caused by a, by, a, by a disease, like for example, somebody that died of uh, old age or um, something like that. So if X was caused by Y and Y is not associated to a disease ID, then this is not a cancer related death. So basically we ran our implementation of our reasoner and we were able to ascertain that 562 people died of cancer related deaths in the year 2019. Of course, this is not a comprehensive uh, list. We can only be as complete as our sources are. Uh, these are the number of cancer related deaths registered in, uh, in Wikidata for the year 2019. And well, at this point during the presentation, I often, um, or like sometimes when I presented this work, I, I get questions that why, you know, like why, why do we want to use logics? Um, why do we want to use logics to do this? No, like, I mean, this seems to be a simple enough query. Somebody could just like run uh, or write a JavaScript or like a Python script to, to compute all this information and get the answers that you, that you want. And basically here my argument is uh, twofold. The first part is that this is, uh, logics are like a fully declarative language and this gives you a number of advantages when you have to do like analysis on the types of answers that you get back. Let me show you what I mean. So for example, one of the uh, answers that we get here, if we do not restrict ourselves to the year uh, 2019 is that Ada Lovelace uh, died, uh, died of cancer, no? And imagine that I'm the, uh, the, the manager of this data and I get this answer and I, I don't understand why uh, this is an answer. Perhaps I think that this is a mistake or that something went wrong. Now, because this is a declarative language, what I can easily do is I can obtain a proof um, <clears throat> for this answer, which explains how this uh, came to be. So basically a proof is represented as a tree. Here I would have the, the fact, and then I can ask, well, where does this fact come from? Well, it comes from <clears throat> these three facts. So these two were in Wikidata. This one was logically uh, inferred during the reasoning process and the application of rule number four. So rule number four tells me that if X was caused by Y and Y is a disease ID set and set is a type of cancer, uh, <clears throat> then this is a cancer related death. Um, so basically I obtained that fact. And I can keep on uh, <clears throat> pulling backward and I know exactly <clears throat> how this fact was produced. And this is really, really helpful, for example, when it comes to debugging. Uh, you know, if really this was a mistake, it is possible that I would easily see it, you know, like there's some form of unicity that explains me how each step was taken here uh, and gives me a lot of uh, a lot of information. So I really think that this could be very, very useful for uh, for debugging, for analyzing data, and so on and so forth. Especially if you think about uh, applications in the medical domain where um, it's really important that you do not uh, make mistakes here, no? Like if you have diagnosed someone with some form of cancer, you would not want to <clears throat> tell them <laughs> that they're healthy, you know, by mistake. Another important reason is that, um, or another thing that's useful about this language is being declarative is that we provide for you the, the reasoner implementation. You just have uh, to write the formulas, explain what you want, and then the reasoner will compute it for you. Now, this is a very, very simple example. Like uh, here again, you know, you could write a JavaScript and it's probably uh, fast enough. But uh, sometimes when you have to, for example, use non-deterministic rules, you have to deal with uh, rules that will show you different possibilities in which something can be can be derived. Uh, having a powerful reasoner that is efficient can really uh, make the difference and can really provide you the answers that you're looking for within a reasonable time frame. 
I'm going to speed up a little bit. I'm going to finish in a minute here. Uh, just tell you a little bit about my research goals. So I would like to develop efficient algorithms and implementations for query answering with expressive ontological languages. I'm going to focus on explainability. And my end goal is to enable the use of ontologies of logical languages on top of knowledge graphs for both users and developers. So the challenge is here is that query answering is a complex reasoning task uh, from a theoretical point of view, but also from a practical point of view. From a theoretical point of view, these are problems that are usually complicated. You need to study complexity, decidability, and so on and so forth. From an implementation point of view, it's always challenging to come up with implementations that can be very efficient in the presence of very large amounts of facts. So knowledge graphs are really, really uh, big. We need to develop implementations that can cope uh, with this large amount of uh, yeah, which is a uh, fact. <clears throat> so I will continue to focus on description logics and disjunctive existential rules. So just <clears throat> to end with a slide, <clears throat> I will leave you my uh, contact information like email, uh, my address, my personal page. Uh, and uh, just a suggestion, if you were interested by what I had to say and you would like to know a little bit more uh, what I'm doing, I suggest that you look into this presentation. So this is a presentation that I gave uh, during an event that I organized last uh, last year here at Montpellier about reasoning with uh, with existential rules. So I gave an introductory presentation of uh, to my research here, and I think this is like a very very good uh, document to know a little bit more um, what I am doing. With this, I conclude. Uh, the talk. I thank you for your attention. 